Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Ross, can you hear me? Or is it possible that the, the problem is your um your earpiece? Can you speak directly from from your, your laptop? Because um, I can't hear I'm, you. Okay, now I can I believe, hear you. Wait. Yeah, I believe you should be able to hear me now. Awesome, I can hear you now. Okay, can you keep this microphone on um, and then still share with the other screen? I'm basically on a different device. Um, is this... Oh, what is happening to my phone? So how do you connect so that you can yeah, we have it right. Yeah. So, if you can share my screen that I've shared. There we go. Can you hear that? Are we good? Is this sound working? Perfect. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, I guess I shall get started. Um, perfect. Is everything working? Okay, perfect. So hello and welcome to the molecular dynamics part of this workshop. Um, obviously, we are starting a little bit late. So sadly, I will have to skip over some of the things that I wanted to get through. Um, initially, the plan was for this to be kind of an interactive workshop. Um, so if you've had the opportunity to download some of the software that was sent out, um, then amazing. But if not, then if you just watch along, there is a um, document that I've uploaded to GitHub, um, but you should be able to kind of follow along in your own time um, and potentially even rewatch this video to kind of see if you're understanding how everything's working. Um, so the overview of this workshop is basically, it's going to be a start to finish molecular dynamics process. Um, we're gonna be starting from finding out where you can download crystal structures um, and going all the way through to docking the ligand within a protein, um, parameterizing the ligand, setting up and running a molecular dynamic simulation, and then finally um, attempting to do some kind of further analysis on these simulations as well. Um, so as I said, the slides are available on GitHub as long as well as the document. I'll just quickly show, this is the GitHub page. Um, the document that you really, if you're planning on following along with need to download is here. Um, and yeah, the, the, I believe the email that was sent out yesterday um, should have a link to that document as well. Um, so yeah, if you intend to follow along, then please do follow along that way. Um, so very quickly, me, I'm going to skip over this part just because of time um, but basically i'm a phd student at the university of Not nottingham and i i do a lot of molecular dynamics um, and biochemistry um within the school um so skipping over that in the interest of time so this workshop we're going to be um basically doing an entire molecular dynamics simulation workflow um, kind of thing on a terpene synthase um, and the exact terpene synthase is bornal diphosphate synthase so um, it's a well-known, well-characterized protein. Um, and basically, it's the protein alone is 4,500 atoms in size. Um, and that's not including any ligand or so, uh, solvent molecules. Um, and so obviously, I don't know if you guys attempted to run some of the QM calculations earlier in bang session, um, but they took quite a long time and you were only really working with four atoms. So to scale it up to kind of four, and a half thousand five thousand atoms these calculations at a qm level would take an incredibly long amount of time and that's why we use molecular dynamics um, it's substantially cheaper and allows us to simulate the movement of 
atoms and molecules over a much longer time period than QM would ever let us do. Um, it also allows us to simulate at room temperature and, as I say, over a, an actual time frame, which is always nice. Um, the ligand that we're going to be looking at is this relatively boring monoterpene carbocation. Um, the reason why I've chosen this ligand is it will highlight a couple of standard problems that you may come across when trying to do molecular dynamics. Um, there's a lot of tutorials out there on how to do a protein ligand molecular dynamics simulation, but very, very few of them cover what to do if you have a charged ligand. Um, and so that's why I picked carbocation. Um, it just means that I can go through a little bit more of a detail of how to deal with systems like this. Because obviously, if you're trying to do any reactions within a protein, um, there is a chance that you may do some deprotonations um, in order to undergo this type of reaction. Um, another problem with this specific ligand is it's a mixture of sp2 and sp3 hybridized carbons. Um, and so it will also highlight some of the common mistakes that people make when using specific, especially automated tools like we will be using later, um, where it incorrectly assigns things like hybridization states for the ligand. Um, so overview then, we're gonna be docking a, downloading and docking a ligand, parameterizing it, setting up and running a molecular dynamic simulation, and then attempting, if we have time at the end, um, to approximate the free energy of binding using thermodynamics. Um, We've seen that. Um, so first step is to obtain the ligand. Um, now, crystal structures and protein crystal structures are usually characterized through NMR or there's, there's a few different ways that you can kind of obtain the crystal structure of a protein. And usually what happens is once the crystal structure has been obtained, it's usually uploaded to a database like the RCFB protein data bank here. Um, and usually, this is usually just a huge database full of crystal structures. Um, and so whenever you're trying to work on molecular dynamics, the best place to start is to first find the protein you're interested in, and you'll find it on a place like this. Um, there's also the Worldwide um, Protein Data Bank, which again is a very similar website. I think they're actually affiliated, um, where you can go and you can find the crystal structure that you're looking for. Um, and then if the structure hasn't been actually resolved yet and um, there's also uniprot which also has sequence data as well as crystal structures um, but for today the workshop that we're going to be doing we're going to be using the protein bornal diphosphate synthase and specifically the protein with this code here 1n23 most resolved proteins have a four digit code um, so you can just search that on, on the database and you should come to this website web page here. Um, and what's nice about the RCSB website is you can actually click on this button here. Um, and for, within the web browser, you can actually get a three dimensional um, object that you can interact with and actually ensure that the protein is the correct protein that you're wanting to work with before you even download it. Um, so obviously, if you're trying to find a good protein to start with, um, this is a great tool to use. The reason why we're using this specific protein um, is if you look into the active site here, the diphosphate is already broken from the ligand that was co-crystallized with the protein. Um, and so that's going to make our do docking protocol a lot easier um, because we don't need to dock whilst bound to the diphosphate. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go back and we're going to click download files and copy the link to the PDB file um, and then switch to our terminal. Um, and first of all, we're going to just create um, some folder structures so that you don't end up getting confused with your files. It's really easy to you end up creating a lot of different files that quite often can be named very similar things um, while doing molecular dynamics. and so. Sorting out your folders and your subdirectories is really, really important um, so that you don't get confused and overwrite, um, overwrite any work. So what we're going to do is we're going to type make directory mcdeer. Um, if you're on Windows, by the way, you can also do this just using your file explorer. Um, but I'm on Linux. Uh, and also, I'd highly recommend if you are trying to follow along um, to use Windows subsystem for Linux um, or Linux if you can, um, as most of these tools are command line based. 
So we're going to make directory um, and we're going to call it structures, um, which I've already made. And we're going to go into the structures and we're just going to type we get, which is web get, and then the um, link, the, the, the URL of that protein and download it. Um, perfect. So once we've downloaded the protein, we want to, first of all, it's always good to do this um, sense check, but we have downloaded the correct protein. Um, and the way that you can kind of visualize proteins on your own personal computer, obviously, we've just shown you how to do it on the web browser, um, but it's through a piece of software called VMD. Um, and I'm not sure if you've had a chance to download VMD or already have it installed. Um, if you don't, don't worry, just kind of watch along. Um, but if you do, please feel free to give it an attempt as well. Um, but all you need to do is type vmd1n23.pdb um, and open it up. And you should get something that looks a little bit like this. Um, so here you've got kind of your your GUI display, which shows the, the protein. Um, and then here is kind of your main main terminal which allows you to interact with these structures um, now obviously this looks very different to what we just saw on the um, rcsb website um, and that's because it's showing you all of the chemical bonds within the protein and that can obviously be quite confusing um, especially if um, especially if uh, there are so many atoms. So what we're going to do first of all is we're going to go into representations um, and change the drawing method from lines to new cartoon. And straight away, this should produce, let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys so that you can see um, a more standard protein structure that you, that you would be used to and you'd probably see in publications, etc. cetera. Um, what you will notice is that there's actually two separate proteins here. There's, um, there's no bond connecting these pro proteins, and that's because as the, the crystal structure um, kind of, as the crystal, was, the crystal structure was resolved, it was actually co-isolated as two proteins, not just one. Um, and so the structure is often, you quite often find protein crystal structures to be dimers or even trimers um, of a protein. Um, another thing that you can do is you can change the representation um, so you can create a second representation and you can also highlight the active site. So there's different residues within the active site. Um, for example, the diphosphate of magnesium atoms. Um, we can show these by typing res name, pop and MG, which are the names of the residues and changing this drawing method to CPK, which is more of your traditional ball and stick representation. And here you can see, um, kind of the diphosphate and the magnesium atoms in the active site. There is also a 2BN residue, which is the ligand that was co-isolated with this protein. Um, I'm just centering it here so you can see it slightly better, um, but you can also show that as well. So now that we've downloaded the crystal structure and we're happy that it is the crystal that we want, um, we're just gonna close out of VMD and switch back to our terminal. Um, I believe there were some problems with being able to see. Um, so hopefully uh, the increased text size has helped a little bit. Um, please, David, if not, let me know. Um, but we're gonna move past here and we're gonna go, we've looked at the crystal structure. This in, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, by the way, is the working document, the PDF that I've sent out. So if you're trying to follow on, roughly trying to, to stay in line with this, um, it's probably a good place to be. Um, so we've looked at our crystal structure. Um, but as I said, we've actually got two protein structures um, in our file. And obviously simulating the protein twice is twice as computationally expensive. So we're going to want to get rid of one of those protein structures. So that basically you reduce the system to as small as possible and it just makes the calculation much quicker and much simpler to run. Um, and the way we're going to use it is we're just gonna use some basic command line tools to start with, um, grep predominantly. Um, and so we're going to grep, which basically finds everything in a file that matches a string. Um, and then we're gonna do grep minus V, which is 
finds everything except for that string basically um and space b space and the reason for that i'll show you in fact i'll show you now if you were to open up that 1n20 pdb file 1n20 pdb um and we were to scroll down really far um you basically end up with atoms their atomic index so the number in which the atom is um some atom typing the amino acid resi residue name and then this next column here um basically tells you what protein it is part of and so there's an a protein and a b protein um so if we were to go further down we would actually eventually find it switched from a to b um so here you can see we've switched from a b protein we're trying to basically get rid of all of that b protein so we've only got the a protein um so yeah as i said we're going to use grep minus v space b space one and 23.b db and we're going to push all of that information into a new file and we're going to call it 1n23 monomer.pdb um, and if we were to open that up and it's always good whenever you're trying to do any shortcuts like this to open it up and check that what you've tried to do is correct um, we're going to go vim 1n23 monomer.pdb um, and what you'll find is that for the most part, we only have um, this space A space um, showing that we've only got the A crystal structure. Um, if you scroll far enough down though, you'll find that actually, sadly the A space A, uh, A space B space didn't actually work for a few of the water molecules um, because there was no space afterwards. And so what we've just got to really quickly do is manually delete these atoms as well. Um, so we'll just delete those lines and then that should be all good. And if we were to VMD that structure now, um, oh, wrong one. So we pull up VMD and let me find my browser um, and file open the monomer and um, you'll find that there is now only one protein in this file and again if we were to switch for representations to new car um, new cartoon um, we would only see one protein now which is exactly what we want um, so we've now got a singular protein the next step obviously um is to obtain our ligand um, and so what we're going to do is we're actually going to go onto the github page um, i have already provided um i believe it is in no nope, it's not in data it's in files um, so files and structures um, our ligand um, structure file is going to be here so if you just click on that ligand structure file and i go onto the raw and copy the um, web address. You can't actually see that, but um, just copy the web address or download it just how you download any file off of GitHub. Um, and then if we switch back into our terminal, um, we're just going to type that we get and the um, URL for the ligand, and that should also download our ligand. Um, if you are struggling to find the ligand, um, in the MD workshop, um, there is also the link here. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I'll see if I can highlight it. I oh, know I can't quite highlight it. Um, but yeah, there, there is. Um, Hi, yes. Rose. Are you able to increase the font size, like Control Plus? Because the terminal font is like really tiny. The terminal, is it still small? Yeah, it's really small. Um, it shouldn't be. Uh, but the workshop is small, the PDF is small, um, but I, I can't really increase the terminal any bigger than it currently is. One second, let me see if, um, let me try one other thing. Okay. Um, um, make this bigger. Um, nope. 
One second, PDF and terminal. Um, no, it's not that one. Is that better? Okay, maybe you can just continue this way. Thank you. Is, is this not better? Yeah, yeah, it's better, it's better. Okay. Um, uh, so, it's getting yeah. Smaller again. It's getting small, okay, yeah. Is that better? Yeah, it's better. Is, that, is yeah. this big enough? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect, yeah. apologies team. Um, so yeah, we should have downloaded um, downloaded this uh, ligand file, um, and kind of that is a good place to be. Um, so we've got our protein and our ligand that we intend to dock. Um, so we can now move on to docking the ligand. Um, so just very quickly, the ligand that we are using today um, is actually from Dan Major's work. Um, the reference to the paper is here. Um, and it's this intermediate number one on this reaction pathway. Um, it is a natural ligand for this synthase protein. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to be basically working with intermediate number one. Um, and if you were to want to retry this workshop with a different ligand, I'd highly recommend going back to this paper um, and trying with a different one of his structures. Um, so now that we've got the structures, we're going to try molecular docking. Um, and so very briefly, um, molecular docking basically attempts to find the best binding pose within an active site. Um, it's not a perfect technique. Um, it uses a numerical scoring function, um, which can be parameterized with a variety of different things like electronegativities, partial charges, um, hydrogen bond acceptance, or like donation ratios, things like that. Um, so yeah, the, it can be heavily parameterized um, and there is no kind of one gold standard of docking simulations. Um, the most important thing, if you kind of take anything away from today, is do some research on similar systems to the system that you're trying to dock with and see what other people are using. Um, usually someone will have done a benchmark for a similar system, say for terpene synthases, someone will have benchmarked a variety of different docking softwares. Um, and so, yeah, make sure that you try and find the best docking sys uh, software for your system um, but be aware that these numerical scoring functions can be really good for certain systems but also be really bad for other sy systems now how molecular docking works is it basically it takes an initial guess of your active site and then it uses usually some form of monte carlo sampling to attempt to place your ligand in many different orientations um, in the active site it then uses this numerical scoring function to score the new positions um, based on this scoring function and basically assign it a binding affinity. Um, some softwares claim they can also equate that to energy. Um, but as I say, their scoring functions can sometimes not always be as accurate as they seem. Um, so definitely be careful when using docking. Um, the docking software we're going to be using today is Nina. Um, which does use Monte Carlo to sample configurational set space. Um, and then it uses a convoluted neural network, so machine learning algorithm, um, to basically score these poses. And what's really nice about that is that it's not based on some kind of chemical intuition that could be biased. So it's not ignoring charge. It's not ignoring Van der Waals interactions. Um, and it kind of is taking an average of a lot of different parameters um, in order to assign a binding score. Um, it's not the best docking software out there. Um, as I say, it does depend on your system, but it's a really easy to use software as well, which makes it really nice for this workshop. The command to use um, Nina is up on the screen here. It should also be on the workshop document as well, if you are planning on using it. Um, so you need to basically download Nina. There are instructions on how to do so in the document. Um, and then you provide it with a receptor. So this is going to be on our, our monomer um, protein. Um, and then you obviously give it the ligand that you wish to dock. Um, and then you give it a, a guess of 
where the active site is. And the guess that we're going to be using is going to be the position of that ligand that was co-crystallized with the protein, that 2BN ligand. Um, and then we're going to output it to a .mol2 output file. Um, and then this dash no GPU, um, basically that just allows you to speed it up if you, well, GPU allows it to speed it up if you have one. Um, I've left no GPU in, in case um, you don't have a GPU to accelerate the software, then obviously use no GPU. Um, so switching back to the terminal, we're going to go out of our structures directory um, and we're going to go into our docking um, subfolder. If you haven't made a docking subfolder, don't worry, you can make one nice and quickly. Um, and we're also going to copy over our one um, structures, one N23 monomer crystal structure into this folder. And we're also going to copy over our um, ligand structure into this folder. Um, now, obviously, I don't know if you can see um, in the Dynamics Workshop PDF, um, the file names are slightly different. And that's because we need to do one other thing. Well, two other things. We need to extract that 2BN structure into its own, into its own file, basically. Um, and again, we're going to use grep for that. So it's just grep quotes 2BN from 1N23 monomer. And we're going to call that 2BN.pdb. And if you were to look at that file, 2BN.pdb, um, that is just the ligand on its own. Uh, and then we're also going to grep everything but 2BN. Uh, minus, so we're going to use that minus V command, 2BN from 1N23monomer.pdb. And we're going to call that 1N23monomer, um, but no ligand, because it now has no ligand in the active site. Um, and it's really useful to keep track of these naming conventions um, so that you don't get confused and try and dock a ligand on top of a different ligand, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, we're going to do that. Um, and then we're going to find our Nina extension. Um, I'm using modules, so let me just quickly load um, Nina. Uh, and then we're going to use the command that was shown on the slide. So this command here, I'm not going to use the dash no GPU because I have GPU acceleration. Um, but if you are doing it and you don't have GPU, obviously include that. Um, but we're just going to type Nina minus receptor, so the empty protein with no ligand in, minus ligand, um, and it's going to be our lig.mol2, minus auto box, underscore ligand, can't type today. Um, and that's going to be our two boronitrile um, crystal structure. Output it to a dot, dot mol2 and hit enter. And what have I typed wrong? What's it saying? Apologies. I just can't type it because it's dash dash. I apologize. And then hopefully nice and quickly, it will give us um, a nice long output file. There'll be a lot of warnings um, and that's because we've not really double checked our PDB file. Um, if you were to do this not in a workshop, you'd probably want to go through and just fix any connectivity records in a PDB file. Um, but to be honest, this won't cause us issues as we've got tools that will fix our structure down the line. Um, and basically, it'll, it's given us 10 or 9 structures, um, and it's scored them using an empirical force field, um, an empirical scoring function, like a traditional docking software, and then using this convoluted neural network work. Um, usually, um, yeah. These affinities are trying to approximate to energies, but whether they mean anything is yet to be determined. Um, it's, it's useful then to look at some of these structures. So again, we can use VMD. Um, so we're just going to VMD and run VMD and we'll switch so that you guys can see. Okay, so we've got VMD. 
So first of all, you're going to want to load in the empty protein. Um, and then with a new molecule, we're going to load in our doc.mol2 file. And what will happen is it'll zoom in and you won't be able to see anything probably yet. Um, and then just like every other time that we've pulled anything up on VMD, the first thing we're going to do is go into our switch to our protein, our 1N23 monomer, no ligands, um, and switch that to new cartoon. And that should look something a little bit more like what we're used to. Um, and then on our doc.mol2, we're going to change that to the CPK ball and stick um, way of looking at things. And again, we should now be able to see our docked ligand within the protein active site. Um, what's also probably useful is on our protein crystal structure to create another representation um, and show our diphosphate and our magnesium atoms that are also in the binding site. Um, and then you can see the orientation of the ligand with respect to that diphosphate um, and iron, basically. Um, what's really nice now is, oh, click the wrong button. Um, you can actually scroll through the different docked poses um, that have been generated by Nina. Um, and you can literally scroll through and see all of the different docked poses. And then using that output from earlier, you can see the kind of affinity that was assigned to each of them. It's usually good at this point, um, although we don't really have time um, to go through and just double check that the, score, the scores are sensible. Um, I did notice that some of the empirical scores showed that different docked positions, uh, different docked poses were actually lower in energy. Um, and that would usually be a cause for concern. Um, but for this workshop, we're just gonna take the, the initial structure of a pose zero um, so making sure that we've scrolled all the way back to the zero um, frame uh, and we're just going to click on the docked mall two and right click on it and oh, right click on it and click save coordinates um, and change the last to zero and save it as a mall two file. Save all atoms as a mall two file for first and last frames of both zero and press save. And we're going to call this pose underscore one dot mol2. And what this is doing is it's basically allowing VMD to save our, basically break up our docked dot mol2 output file, which has got a lot of doc poses in it, and just save the, the first docked pose, basically, which is usually the, the best scoring docked pose. Um, so once we've done that, we can delete the docked dot mol2. Um, and just reload that pose1.mol2 um, just basically to double check that we have saved only one structure and that it is the right structure. We've not just saved a protein twice. Um, and once we're happy with that, we can close down the MD um, and move on. So one thing that you'll notice um, if we were to open up that pose1.mol2 um, is there is no hydrogen atoms. And obviously in our ligands that we're working with, there are, um, there should definitely be some hydrogen atoms. Um, you'll also notice that, so here is a mol2 file and these are kind of the atom types and C.2 is indicating that it's an sp2 hybridized carbon. Um, C.3 is sp3 and so on. Um, you'll notice that there's one, two, three, four C.2s indicating four sp2 carbon atoms but in our ligand there's actually five because we've got a carbocation um and so that is also a problem the biggest problem though as i say is we currently don't have any hydrogen atoms um, and so the first thing we're going to do is try and add some hydrogens back in and the tool that we're mainly going to be using to do this um, is a kind of molecular structure converter tool. It's called Open Babel. Um, and what's really nice is we can just call it Open Babel um, minus I mol2 because it's a mol2 file type. Um, and then just the name of the file. Um, and then minus O, we're going to export it to an XYZ file. And the reason why we're going to do that is because I'm wanting 
basically restructured to forget the um, atom typing information. And a .xyz file doesn't contain any atom typing. It just contains elemental data. Um, and so when we then go in and manipulate the structure to delete um, one of the atoms, which you'll see in a minute, it won't just break the structure, basically. And then finally, minus capital O, we're just going to call this file pose underscore one dot x, y, z. The final command that you need to add here is minus H, which will just add hydrogen atoms um, automatically to the structure. Hit enter and we'll get one molecule converted. And if we were to visualize, uh, well, open up this file, um, you can see that it now has carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, um, 28 atoms which is starting to sound a little bit more sensible. 28 atoms, though, is one too many hydrogens. Um, and for our carbocation, we actually want 27 um, hydrogen atoms. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go into BMD and we're going to open up that pose1.xyz. Um, and if we switch our view to CPK, um, you can see here that we've just got an extra hydrogen atom where we shouldn't. And, and as you can see, that hydrogen atom is where we'd expect the carbocation to be. Um, so all we need to do, because we've got a .xyz file, is we need to find out what, what atom this is and delete it from the file. Um, so if you press 1 on your keyboard and then you select the atom, you'll see on our terminal um, that it then prints out some information about the atom that you've selected. And the important bit here is that it's atom index number 12. Now I know that VMD is zero index, so the first atom is actually atom zero. Um, and so all we need to do is we go into our file so we can close VMD, um, and we just go into our pose1.xyz, and we go 13 lines down from the first carbon atom. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, and just delete that line. Save it, um, and then go back into VMD. Um, and you'll see, because I've just saved that and I've tried to open it, there's no file there. Um, and it's because I made a mistake that I always make. And it's that we've deleted a line, um, but we've not changed the total number of atoms in the system. And so VMT is looking at this and going, well, I'm expecting 28 atoms, but there's only 28, 27 atoms in the file. So I'm not going to show anything. If we were to change this to a 27 and reopen it, um, here we go, we can now see our structure um, with the correct number of hydrogens in the right place, and it looks pretty much like our ligands, and we're pretty much ready to go. So almost there, almost ready to do some molecular dynamics. Um, the last thing is we want to convert it back to a .mol2 file um, and gain back in that bonding information. So again, we can use Open Babel one last time. Open Babel one last time. O Babel minus I. This time it's an XYZ file that we're inputting. Um, XYZ uh, minus O. We're going to convert it into a MOL2 file as MOL2 files have bonding information. Um, minus capital O. We'll call it pose1.mol2 again. Um, and hit enter and everything's good. Um, one last thing to check, and this always happens, so it's always worth checking, um, is if you open up that pose1.mol2 file and you count the number of sp2 carbon atoms, you'll notice there's only four, and we would expect five as we have a carbocation. So I'm going to skip a step here, but we can use the same process again um, to figure out which carbon is has been incorrectly assigned the carbo, uh, the SP3 hybridization state, um, but I actually know that it's carbon two. Um, so I'm just going to replace the C3 into a C2 um, just so that we can move on nice and quickly. But as I say, you can use exactly the same method that we use to find the hydrogen 
to find which one is a C3, which should be a C2. Um, we can save that file then, um, and that is it for our docking protocol. Um, we now have a, a docked ligand um, in within a protein, and if we were to just look at that, um, we can just go 120 no lig.pdb. Um, and then if we were to load in our pose1.mol2, um, we now have a ligand within a protein, um, which has got the correct elements on it, the correct number of atoms with the correct bonding information. So now we can move on to doing some dynamic setup. So we'll move out of our docking folder um, and we'll switch um, to this. Um, moving out of our docking folder and we're going to make a new structure called dynamics. And we're going to, oh, apologies, um, switch into that. So CD dynamics. Um, and we're going to then create a, a subdirectory within that directory called setup. So it might make directory setup. Go into setup, um, and then we're going to copy from our docking folder um, our pose1.mol2 to the folder, and we're also going to copy the empty protein. So 1N23 monomer, no ligand into our folder. Um, now it gets to the interesting part. Um, let me switch to the slides. So molecular dynamics, um, a very, very brief overview. I'm not going to go into any of the nitty gritty equations, but basically uh, molecular dynamics relies on an empirical force field um, in order to calculate the energy, the potential energy of the system. And from there, it then uses um, Newton's laws of motion in order to create the dynamics part of molecular dynamics. Um, but for these empirical force fields, these empirical force fields need parameters that explain or, or calculate the energy contribution from every part of the system, be it the electrostatic interactions, the bonding interactions, the angles, the dihedrals, everything kind of has a parameter um, for it. Now, the force field that we're going to be using today is the AMBER FF14SB force field. Um, any AMBER force field or any other force field for that matter um, would work for, for, this, for this system, but I've just kind of chosen this one because it's what I use personally. Um, but these force fields are really well parameterized for standard molecules like amino acids um, and for simple ligands. Um, but as soon as you start to get to complex ligands, especially charged ligands, you need to calculate some of your own parameters for them. Um, and so this is what we're going to do now. We're going to parameterize our ligand so that it can be understood within the realms of this E total potential energy. Um, so, the software that we're going to be using um, is called AC Pipe, um, and it's an automated tool that basically automates a couple of separate tools within AMBER, um, which is our molecular dynamics package that we're going to be using today. Um, if you want to learn more about how to parameterize within AMBER, um, I have left a link um, at the bottom of this page here, so page 29, in the workshop, um, which will basically explain parameterization the more kind of correct way. This is just an automated tool that will speed things up for the workshop. Um, so how are we going to do it? AC Pipe is a Python Conda package, um, which if you have installed, you should be able to just activate. So I'm going to activate mine. Conda activate my AC Pipe. Um, and then from AC pipe, um, you should be able to type the command um, seen on the right hand side of a screen. And uh, let me pull it up so that it, in fact, I don't think I have one on a slide. Um, so basically, the command is going to be AC pipe minus I, so the input structure, um, the input ligand that we're going to parameterize. Um, and then pose one dot mole two. Um, 
Now, AC pipe also calculates the partial charges for each of the atoms, which are also needed for the force field. Um, and the charge method we're going to use um, minus C is the A and one BCC, or in AC pipe, it's just BCC for short. Um, the reason why we're going to use this is it's nice and quick to set up. Um, and also the majority of the amber force field is parameterized using AM1 BCC charges. Um, and so it means that they're nice and compatible with each other. Um, the next thing is we need to tell it the net charge of the system. And as we've got a carbocation, the net charge is one. Um, and then the last thing is the atom types. Now, there's lots of different versions of atom types. There's lots of different ways of basically saying, this is an FP3 hybridized carbon, this is an FP2 hybridized carbon. Um, and basically, it's really important that you get the correct atom types so that it is understood by the force field. Um, and so we're going to use the general amber force fields or GAF atom types for this ligand um, just because we're using the GAF protocol in order to parameterize it. If you've typed that out, then you should be able to just hit enter um, and it should work for you, basically. Um, if you give it a minute, it yeah, six seconds, um, and it should have produced you some new parameters for your ligand. You'll notice that it gives you a warning saying that the charge isn't zero. That's absolutely fine. Um, that's actually just an output from a, a different piece of software that AC pipe is calling. Um, obviously, the, the charge of the system isn't zero because we've told it the charge is one. Um, if we then go, if we look in our folder, you'll notice that it's generated a new subdirectory called pose1.acpipe. If we go into there, um, you can actually see it's generated a lot of different structures, uh, a lot of different files, sorry. What's really nice about acpipe is it's not only for amber force fields, but it can also generate um, parameter files and coordinate files for lots of different molecular dynamics packages. So you can see here that we've got charm parameters, we've got Gromax topologies, um, all sorts of different softwares that you can use. But the ones we're interested in is this pose one anti-chamber force field modification. It's called a force field modification file because it's a file you load in alongside a force field and it just adds extra parameters. And then this new mol2 file, um, which is should be basically identical to our pose one mol2 file, um, but with new atom typings and atomic charges. Um, if you were to open up um, the force field modification file, you can basically see that all of the elements are already known. So it hasn't updated any masses. All of the bonds are pretty standard bonds. So it hasn't needed to create any new bonding parameters. And the only things it has really needed to generate is a new bond angle, um, which is actually the bond angle for the delocalized carbocation, um, as there's actually three sp2 carbons in a row. Um, so it's generated that angle there um, and it's explained why it's used the parameters that it's using so it's basically saying it's the same as having four sp2 carbons in a row and then some improper dihedrals as well um, but again it explains why it's chosen those as well um, so we're going to go out of that subdirectory and we're going to copy the force field modification file into our setup folder and also the new mol2 file. Perfect. Now, the last step before we set up our molecular dynamic simulation is um, our protein, our protein structure for 1N23 monomer no lig um, currently contains our protein and then our magnesium atoms and our diphosphate. Um, anion that are also in the active site. In, in theory, this shouldn't be a problem and you should be able to le uh, load it into our molecular dynamics setup software um, and it should just run. Um, however, sometimes this doesn't work. So it's actually best practice. If you've got any kind of 
other ligands that are not amino acids within the active site, it's often worth splitting them out first and then loading them into our setup tool, basically. Um, so we're going to do that now. So again, using GREP, um, GREP is an incredibly powerful tool in molecular dynamics. We're going to extract our magnesium atoms um, from our 1N23 monomer and just call create the new file um, mg.pdb. Nice and simple. We're also going to do the same for our diphosphate. Pop um, 1N23 and we're going to call that pop dot pdb perfect and then the final step that we need to do with our protein file um is again the atom typing which is you'll, you'll notice there's a trend here atom typing is not consistent between different pieces of software and so we need to make sure that the atom typing within the protein structure file is correct and can be understood by amber and so what we're going to use we're going to use a tool called amber amp 4 pdb um, which basically converts any pdb file um, into an amber pdb file so it basically changes the um, atom names um, so that it can be understood by the setup software um, so i'm going to switch from ac pipe to amber tools so conda activate amber tools 21 um it's just a version of amber tools that i've got but you guys should have installed a, a later version if you're trying to follow uh, along um so i've activated amber tools and i'm just going to type pdb for amber um and it should be oh, apologies i don't know if you can still see um so pdb for amber um, and then using the command at the top of page 31 in the document, um, the input file is going to be our um, protein, 1 and 23 monomer no lig. Um, our output, we're just going to call this protein now, um, protein.pdb. And then the final thing that you need to add is our strip mask. So we've um, we've we've kind of taken we've taken out our magnesium atoms and our diphosphate atoms um, but we haven't actually removed them from the original file so am um, for pdb can do this so minus strip and then this colon mg comma pop uh, and you can basically put a list of residues that you want to strip from the file uh, and hit enter enter don't worry about the warnings um they're basically to do again with the, the structure file that we actually downloaded isn't perfect but for the for the scope of this workshop, they aren't big problems. Um, and yeah, we should now have a protein file, um, a protein.pdb, um, a pose1.mol2, magnesium and pop PDBs. The final step then, and then we will actually get onto setting up our molecular dynamics simulation is, I know from personal experience that diphosphates can sometimes be misunderstood within the amber force field. Um, and so we're also going to use the AC pipe tool just to make sure that the atom types in the diphosphate ligand or diphosphate molecule are correct. So we're just going to go AC pipe minus I pop dot PB minus C. We're going to use the BCC charges again, but this time uh, the net charge is negative four. And the atom typing that we are going to use is not the GAF atom types. Um, we're going to use the amber atom types. And that's because the magnesium atoms will be amber um, and because it's um, very strongly interacting with the magnesium atoms, it's, it's worthwhile having these as the same atom types. Um, and it's just errored out because I've switched to amber tools. So let me quickly switch back. Conda activate my AC pipe and run that again. It'll run. And all we need from this, it already has all the parameters. Um, so we just need to copy over the pop.ac pipe um, pop underscore um, bcc underscore amber dot mol2 file into this folder. And you should have a bunch of structure files, um, which can be quite confusing. Um, but all we actually need 
is our magnesium.pdb, our pose one antechamber force field modification file, our newly generated pose one dots ligand um, mol2 file, our newly generated diphosphate mol2 file, and then the protein PDB file. Um, so we've now got all the structures we need to run a dynamic simulation. Now all we need to do is combine them. Um, and the tool we're going to use for that is a tool called Leap or T-Leap. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to generate an input file for Leap. So we're just going to call it leap.in. Um, and if you want to download a pre-generated Leap file, um, I believe there is one on the GitHub. Um, so rather than trying to frantically type along with me um, if you go into the md prep there's a leap.in file that you can download rather than try and type out with me um, but for a leap.in file the first things you need to do is you need to load in um, the amber parameters the, the kind of standard amber parameters and so the way we do that is we source them from the leap rc um, I mean, the, the names of these don't really matter. Well, they do matter, but um, it's just the names of a file. So um, .ff14sb, um, that'll load in our standard protein parameter files. We're also going to load in our solvent parameters. So leaprc.water.tip3p. Um, and then we're also going to load in our general amber force field parameters as well. Um, so once we've loaded in our params files, the next thing we're going to load in is our ligand. So we're going to call it lig, and we're going to call it, uh, say equals load mol2, and then the name of our ligand file. So it's going to be pose underscore one underscore btc underscore gaff dot mol2. I know they're a bit of a mouthful, um, and if you were to be doing this a lot, you just have some automated tools that do this for you. Um, we're then going to load in the parameters. So load amber params, uh, and that's going to be called pose underscore one underscore ac dot frc mod. So pose one antechamber for skill modification. And then it's always good to then check. So type check and lick. And that just checks that all the parameters are there and that it's not missing any others. Um, Next, we're going to load in our magnesium atom. So mg equals load pdb, mg.pdb. Um, it's always worth checking everything you load. Um, pop equals load mol2. Um, pop bcc amber.mol2. And then finally, um, the protein. So we'll call that prot So this should have loaded. Um, this will basically load all of the structures in. But they're all individual structures at the moment. And so the next thing you need to do is combine them or glue them together. And the command for that is just combine. So we're going to call it complex equals combine. Um, and then all of those names. So lig, mg, pro, and pop. Pro MG pop leg. Right, perfect. Everything's there. Um, and then the next thing is we need to add our solvent molecules. Now, this is quite a, a, an interesting part. It's, it's where we can actually gain quite a bit of speed up from our simulations. Now, solvent molecules dominate the computational cost of our system. Um, if you think about it, we've got what, four and a half thousand atoms. Um, but then you actually need to add a layer of solvent molecules around our protein. Um, and that layer of protein molecules, you want to be quite thick so that um, as you implement periodic boundary conditions, the protein can't see itself. Um, and so if you were to have a, a, a cubic box, um, 
which is kind of the most basic box that you can get for periodic boundary conditions. Um, if you say had a 10 angstrom solvation layer, which would basically show you um, it's, it's 10 angstroms from the kind of closest to the wall of the protein. Um, if you were to go to a corner section, that could be 30 or 40 angstroms away. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of solvent molecules that aren't actually needed um, in order for the calculation to run. And so what we do is we actually use um, different shaped boxes depending on the shape of our protein. Today, we're going to be using a truncated octahedron, um, which is generally quite a good shape for spherical-ish proteins. Um, but yeah, you want to choose a box size that cl closest matches the shape of your protein so that you can use as few water molecules as possible, um, which will obviously speed up your simulation. Um, so, as I say, we're going to solvate with an octahedral box. So it's just going to be solvate oct. Um, and we're going to be sol solvating our complex using a tip 3P box um, with a 10 angstrom layer, um, which will add a 10 angstrom layer in an octahedral shape around the protein. Um, the next thing, the final thing, is we need to neutralize the system. Molecular dynamics doesn't like charged systems, but sadly a lot of proteins do have a net charge. Um, and the net charge of this protein is actually negative. So we're going to add sodium ions A plus um, to make the charge zero, the net charge zero and neutralize the system. And then finally, save amber palm com. And then the output files that this is going to generate is it's going to be a parameter file and a coordinate file. So the parameter file is going to be called complex.palm7. And the initial coordinates I'm going to call start. So it's going to be start.rst7. And then just quit. Um, save this file and then just type tleap minus f leap.in. And lots of things will happen. Um, but what's really important is at the very end, um, if it just pops up with a few warnings and no errors, then everything should have worked. And as we see, warning, warning, but no errors, which is always a good sign. We can then actually look at the structure that we've just generated by typing VMD, start.restart and complex.com7. And we'll switch to our display. Um, and here we have, you can almost see potentially, um, that truncated octahedron shape. Um, and if we were to add a new representation and switch on our protein structure, maybe turn off our waters as well, um, you can now see it should look basically like our docked ligand looked, but with obviously our solvent layer. Um, And if we switch back there, you can see our ligand is nicely sat in our active site. We are now ready to run molecular dynamics. This is kind of a point um, where you are now set to run a full molecular dynamics workflow. Um, and in the interest of time, um, I'm going to very quickly go over the input files, but we're not going to actually run them as we don't have time to run them. But then I'll quickly show you some of the outputs that they look like if that's OK. So. Closing that, um, if we switch back to our slides. So you've got a start.restart file um, and a parameter file. Those are the two files that you need to start your molecular dynamics simulation. Now, the first thing you'll always do when running a molecular dynamics simulation is not to do a dyna dynamics simulation at all, but to run a minimization. Um, and the reason for that is that when you load in, when you generate these structure files, um, we randomly have placed those solvent molecules within our box. They're all aligned in exactly the same way. And statistically, some of them are going to be clashing with molecules within your protein, which is obviously a problem. And so the first thing you need to do is basically minimize the system and reduce steric clashes. Or if there's any small kinks within the protein structure, it basically allows the system to relax. Um, so that when you start 
calculating dynamics, those dynamics don't quickly escalate and kind of cause a system explosion. Um, so really important, you've got this I min equals one, that's telling Amber or whatever, well, Amber in this case, um, that you're going to perform a minimization. Um, the next two commands aren't massively important, but the fourth one down, max cycles, is the number of minimization steps that you're going to compute. Um, and then some extra information about how often you print to an output file. And then finally, um, your cutoff is your non-bonded cutoff. So for your long-range in interactions, that's um, the variable that you edit there. From your minimization, once you've minimized your system, the next step is actually to heat your molecular dynamics, um, your system. So you're currently at zero Kelvin, um, but most proteins don't exist at, or they do exist at zero Kelvin, but they, they're not naturally at zero Kelvin. They're normally at room temperature. And it's really common in um, simulations that we class room temperature as 300 Kelvin. Um, doesn't matter exactly what temperature you set it to for the kind of scope of this workshop. But yeah, um, we're going to heat the system from zero Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. Um, and the way we do this is we switch I min equal to zero, which tells Amber it's going to run a dynamic simulation um, for 10, uh, 100,000, sorry, 100,000 steps with a time step of 0 0.002 picoseconds so 100,000 steps 0 0.002 picoseconds totals 200 picoseconds of total simulation time um, some printing information um, and then this NMR ops is basically what you can use to change variables so here we're going to be changing this temp zero variable from zero to 300 Kelvin basically once you've heated your simulation um, you then want to equilibrate it. Um, and this is usually where periodic boundary conditions are turned on um, or, well, no, periodic boundary count conditions um, are already on, but where you often switch to kind of pressure control as well. And you can go from your NV, well, so you can start going into your MVT, um, MVP ensembles. Um, but yeah, you're, you're, the best way to kind of understand an equilibration stage is it should be basically the same as your production stage but it allows for any anomalies that have kind of artificially been implemented by your setup procedure to be removed before you start performing any calculations um, and then finally after you've done an equilibration stage you'll do a production stage calculation which the input file should look very similar to your equil equilibration but the number of steps should be much longer and um, usually run production for a lot longer. Um, and then this is how you actually run um, your AMBER simulation. So today um, we're going to be using AMBER um, and the AMBER molecular dynamics package is split into either SANDER, which is the CPU based um, molecular dynamics package and is the one that is included within Amber tools, which you could have downloaded at the start. Um, but then you've got this PMEMD.CUDA, um, which is the GPU accelerated version. Now, I highly recommend using this GPU accelerated version, but sadly it is not free. Um, GP molecular dynamic simulations run substantially quicker on GPUs. Um, and if you are wanting a free GPU based piece of software, NAMD, which is made by the same people that make VMD, can actually read these AMBER parameter and coordinate files. Um, and so you could use NAMD. Um, but for this workshop, if you are trying to follow along, um, to run the minimization, you literally just type SANDER minus O, which basically overwrites all of your temporary files, minus I, and you give it your input file, min.in, um, minus little o, and that pr produces an output file you then give it minus c um, for the structure minus p for the parameters um, and yeah th these are all the different variables that you can give it when as i said we're not going to run the simulation in the interest of time um, but once you've run the simulation um, it's always worth doing some analysis on it so for your minimization as I said, the first the reason why we're doing minimization is we're just trying to 
equilibrate the energy of the system. And as you can see from this plot, this is the data that you will get if you were to run that minimization uh, step. Um, the energy definitely starts to converge by the end of the system. Um, then as you run your heating, this is a plot of temperature versus time. You heat from zero Kelvin to 300 Kelvin during your heating stage. Your equilibration stage, it just allows that heat to stabilize and then your production stage is here. Um, you can also plot the volume. So obviously, as we implement periodic ground conditions and volume uh, pressure control, you can also plot the volume with respect to time. And again, you want these, these plots to have plateaued by the time you reach your production simulation. Um, and then finally, you can also plot the total energy against time, um, which is a really, really useful thing to do. Finally, you can also plot the fluctuation of the, the structure. You'll hear in molecular dynamics the term RMSD used quite a lot. Um, and it's basically how much the atoms have moved compared to a reference structure. Um, and so this is the RMSD of a, the backbone of a protein. Um, and it's usually considered for anything below 1.5 angstroms is a, a pretty solid um, RMSD for the system. Um, I believe we're not going to have time to go through the free energy calculation, sadly. Um, but if you were to use the PDF workshop that has been uploaded to GitHub, please feel free to go through that at your own time. Obviously, you'll also need your own trajectory files um, that you have calculated. But um, this will then allow you to calculate the binding infinity of that ligand within the protein. Um, and kind of, as you can see from the plot of energy against time, these energies are heavily do dominated by the solvent-solvent interactions. Um, and so you can't just extract the energy um, from this plot and say, this is the energy of the system because it's not quite as simple as that. You need to do some further analysis in order to understand the, the binding energy of the ligand. Um, as I say, I don't think we've actually got time to go through the GBSA method, but the theory for it is all in the workshop document. Um, and then there are some other higher level free energy calculations that you can use as well, such as umbrella sampling, um, which feel free to send me an email about. That is what I actually do for my PhD. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in some higher level energy calculations, please let me know. Um, that's how you do it. But I guess I'll wrap up here because I think you guys are have something else to do but thank you very much for listening and yeah if you've got any questions please feel free to email me i'd like to thank my supervisors and obviously my colleagues that i work with um, and yeah i hope you're having a great time switch to uh, youtube to see if there's any messages Is there anyone there? Hello? Has anyone got any questions? Feel free to put any questions in the YouTube chat. I can see um, the YouTube chat. Or if um, or if um, anyone in, in Nigeria, bang, if you've got any questions for me. Russ, can you hear me? Yes.
a method that is better than coupled cluster theory because it doesn't involve a whole load of the orbital approximations. It has its own problems, but I thought it's worth talking about because of one of the applications of it. If you want to understand a material, you need to know its phase diagram. You need to know what structure is its crystal at certain temperatures and pressures. To get those calculations done is difficult because by their very nature, when two things are changing phase in equilibrium with each other, their energies of formation are identical. So very small energy differences are really important in working out when things change from solid to liquid, for example. I wouldn't recommend using a calculation on water to ice unless it's incredibly sophisticated because your melting point of ice could be off by 50 degrees if you're not careful. So these have to be very sensitive calculations. This is a set of calculations on ice itself. And if you didn't know, there are many, many different types of ice crystal. Uh, I'd enjoy some of them today here because it's quite warm. So um, the calculation on this was done using Quantum Monte Carlo. And they were comparing experiments, so you can actually make these different types of ice crystal, with Quantum Monte Carlo on the left. And if you look at the, the blue, the blue is the computational result. The error bars in those are smaller than the error bars in the experimental results because they're difficult experiments. These are accurate enough calculations where you can go back to the experimentalists and say, I don't trust your result. Could you run that again for me? You have to be sure of your calculations, but that's what they did in these, these cases. And if you're doing good computation, that's what you should be able to do. This is not just important for water. Pharmaceutical companies care about this a great deal. The crystal structure that a drug molecule crystallizes in is vitally important to its biological activity. And if you can predict that crystal structure well, you can devise drugs and ways of crystallizing drugs and packaging them that are incredibly important. If a drug, for example, changes its crystal structure, it is no longer allowed to be sold under the same packaging. So being able to predict the stability of crystals is vitally important. So moving on to some other applications. This is a schematic of something called high throughput screening. And in this case, it's not just garbage in, garbage out. Even if you have some garbage going in, the screening process it enables you to take a whole set of bad ideas and throw them away and produce good ideas. This is a very general uh, type of idea. You could be looking for drug molecules that activate in a certain biological site. You could be looking for uh, reaction mechanisms in uh, catalysis, for example. The idea of high throughput screening involves poor methods that screen a whole load of very bad ideas and then increasingly better methods until you get the maybe 10 or 20 reactions or protein structures or whatever it is you care about to do better investigation on. All of this requires putting lots of different bits of software together in pipelines. And I will emphasize again how important it is that you can do programming if you're going to do computational chemistry. What you saw is some experts, uh, Bang and Ross, who, who live uh, by programming most of the time and writing code and, and these sort of things. Uh, those skills are vitally important to be able to put these bits of computational chemistry together. Another application is closer to home for me because it's a paper I was on, uh, and this is in carbon dioxide capture. There are good reasons that we might want to capture carbon dioxide from either industrial waste gases or the atmosphere, but currently the major processes are stuck in the 1960s and indeed are the same processes they used on the space shuttle for scrubbing carbon dioxide. How can you do this better? Well, one idea was, can we use electrochemistry to 
basically capture carbon dioxide in one place and then release it somewhere else. So here's an example where uh, members of my group in collaboration with experimentalists were taking a, a quinone molecule, that's some, some benzene rings and some carbonyl groups on it, and doing some electrochemistry, turning it into its dianion. Then asking the question, does it capture, does it react with carbon dioxide? If so, great. Then can we move it away from that system, change the concentration, take electrons away from it, and release the carbon dioxide? If you can do that, you can control the process of this carbon sequestration electrically and very, very well. So this is where another bit of analysis we didn't talk about yesterday comes in, and it's cyclic voltammetry. There's a, on the bottom left a cyclic voltammogram, which indicates the redox potentials of the two redox states, three redox states between them of the quinone. And on the left is an experimental measurement. I didn't do this because I'm a theoretician, but uh, collaborators did this very well. It turns out that density functional theory in these molecules is very good at doing those sort of calculations. So on the left here, I've got a graph of uh, calculated electrode potentials for these things. And what we were looking for is a bit like high throughput screening, if we can take that molecule and functionalize it, just change some of the functional groups, will it produce better or worse carbon capture? One of the major problems in this is oxygen, which, if you put it, these at the wrong potentials, just destroys your entire system. So we had some tight constraints on that. And the answer for these systems was really, really disappointing. The better your system was at capturing carbon, the worse it was in terms of stability to oxygen. And, uh, but we predicted this from the computational, which means we didn't need to go make all of these molecules. We could just... Uh, we, tested a few of them, and it agreed with the, uh, the computation, so we decided to design different routes. So, next, another important concept is energy generation. Can we capture energy from the sun? And the answer is yes, there are lots of solar panels around, but the maximum possible efficiency of a conventional solar panel is something like 28%. And there may be better ways of doing this. So the process that I'm going to talk about is called singlet fission. You may have heard of this. There's a, a picture that I don't fully understand on the left side, but it's trying to say when you excite a molecule into an excited state, there is a surface it can relax on and convert in that excited state on one molecule into a pair of excited states on two molecules. Why would that matter? Well, in this case, when you excite a molecule to its excited state, the first thing it's going to try doing is emitting light again and going back to its ground state. It's very happy at its ground state. So if you can make that excited state sufficiently unstable that it decays into excited states on different molecules, they cannot relax in the same way. And that's called singlet fission. The singlet state actually splits up into two triplet states on different molecules. So here's an example of a calculation that uh, I didn't do, but uh, used a CAS SCF, so these very multi-reference calculations, because we're looking at excited states where electrons are on different molecules. And it's on two pentacenes, so it had 22 electrons in 22 orbitals. Those are very large calculations. And they were able to characterize the spin density of those excited states and found that the one on the right basically has a triplet state on one molecule and a triplet state on the other, and that's a good candidate for uh, being able to stabilize that energy capture. Right, I'm going to talk a little more about machine learning now. So the whole concept of machine learning is taking data that's often very expensive to produce and being able to do more with it than just the data itself. So here's an example of that. You, if you have a really, really good electronic structure method, couple cluster, you can generate on the left a set of different calculations of a molecule at lots of different geometries. 
different bond lengths and everything like that. You can make a database of that, and that produces, in the middle, the black points sitting on the surface. However, the actual surface at the intermediate points, you didn't do a calculation on. But you can represent that entire surface as a machine-learned potential where it interpolates correctly the gaps between the points. You have to be very careful that you're doing interpolation, which is between two known data points rather than extrapolation, which you don't know anything about in this case. So uh, an example of this is split into two parts. When you take a molecule, you have to decide how to represent a molecule. You might think, well, I've got, as you have today, the coordinates, the x, y, z of each of the atoms. Maybe that's a good representation. It turns out it's a terrible representation for a neural network. Far better are, for example, the bond lengths between the atoms or other more complicated, symmetrized representations. So one of the challenges in using a machine learning model is taking the data you've got and working out a good representation. And currently, the ideas of machine learning are so new that there haven't been many representations tried. So you could be a person to look at a molecule and decide, well, it's clear that it's important. these things are important and those other things are not important. Let me try to use that representation, build a machine learning model, and show whether it's any good. The reason this can be very, very quickly exploited is because all of the tool chains, all of the software to do this, is generally freely available, open source on the internet. And people have done this quite a lot uh, on, on the representation stuff and on the training. So there are two main types of machine learning approach, one involving something called a neural network, where a set of what are effectively neurons mimic the brain and pass information through a network to produce a result. You train that by giving it a test set that uh, the weights of the passing messages through that network uh, change the outputs. You modify that until you get a good answer. Another route is called a kernel bridge regression or a kernel method where you can use your representation on the left to build effectively a set of reference points uh, in space and make your answer an explicit interpolation between them. It feels a lot more physical, but it's not always the best way of doing it. Here's an example of an application in this where they used the second method, uh, using Gaussian approximation potentials, which is one way of doing that, and they studied carbon. Carbon's a great atom. It forms a lot of very interesting structures. And on the left are some of the interesting structures that they decided to look at and study whether or not their machine learning potential was as good as the data they put into it. Their calculations were density functional theory, which was pretty good and they were on some very large systems initially. Their machine learning potential is orders of magnitude faster, which means if you now want to simulate any of those types of structures of carbon, they have a published way of doing that that is orders of magnitude faster than doing density functional. So you can do molecular dynamics on that, or all sorts of things. And all of these data are published. Just ask the authors for how to get uh, that potential and to use those results. So you can build on these people's amazing work. And the right shows how good their uh, energies are. The relative energies of different structures of carbon are pretty good, I would say. Again, you're making an approximation here. So you have to be careful. You might not get exactly the right answer but it might be good enough for your purposes. Another form of machine learning is, again, from the DeepMind company, um, where they created a neural network to understand, or at least to give good folded models of proteins. There's a, an interesting problem in 
biophysics and chemistry, how do you take the DNA sequence of a protein and turn it into the structure? They have basically solved that problem for huge classes of proteins. And they did this with a neural network that's very complicated. They had very many scientists working on it. And they used data from hundreds of thousands of proteins to do this prediction. But the results of this mean that if you have a protein that somebody hasn't been able to crystallize, that's not in that protein data bank that Ross was talking about, and you don't know its structure, you can feed it into this machine learned approach and it will predict a structure that is probably very good. And certainly it's better than trying to fold the protein yourself. One last set of things I'm going to talk about very briefly are, again, close to my heart, they are called quantum computing. Now, this sounds a bit crazy. If we don't really have you know, good uh, NMRs here. How can we use quantum computers? There are only 10 of them in the world. Why would they going to do anything with those? Well, I don't have access to a quantum computer, and I, uh, but I can still do research on them. With theory, design algorithms and methods for these devices and simulate them to see how they work. So loosely, quantum computers, instead of representing information as classical bits, zeros and ones, represent it as a quantum state, sometimes like a spin, so up spin or down spin, or some intermediate combination of bits. You can start then representing chemistry by representing the different configurations of a molecule, uh, of electrons and molecule, by combinations of those sorts of bits. Why is that useful? Well, uh, the problems we have doing exact quantum chemistry are such that it's very expensive because we need to consider so many configurations. If a quantum computer can represent all of those as a superposition of quantum states, it's a very compact approach, and maybe it will lead to far faster computation. I've given an example at the bottom here of a quantum circuit. You don't need to know anything about it. It looks like a, an electronic circuit, but it's got quantum data flowing through it. And if you wanted to turn this into an actual an actual program to run on a quantum computer, it would involve taking, for example, a set of different atoms with different spins and sending microwaves on them to get them coupling together in different ways. These algorithms are very new. People are very excited by them because of the potential for taking really difficult problems and making them really easy. There are simulators of these things. Uh, I'll skip. Yeah, simulated these things that are uh, free for you to use, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, skip, I'll skip past those slides, which basically say currently people don't know how to use quantum computers well. There are lots of people saying they're going to be terrible. You could be somebody with a lot of reading to predict new ways of uh, doing those quantum computing. So, as I conclude. Things to remember, not all bits of uh, computational chemistry are expensive or need a lot of computing. You can do a lot of things with very simple methods that people haven't done before, which might be very interesting. And you can even do it on paper or with a small amount of computer code. If you're using your brains wisely, you can do the work of tens of thousands of computers here. There are huge numbers of free computational resources out there. All of the computational chemists, most of the computational chemists, want you to use their methods. So they try and make them freely available. If you can't find them free, send an email to them, and they might say, yes, I'm happy for you to do that. Machine learning may yet revolutionize a lot of chemistry. It's certainly on its way to doing it. But it provides a lot of resources for everyone to use, because once somebody has used machine learning to describe, for example, protein-protein interaction, they will make that available for you to use it, and you can do interesting science as well. But be careful, 
it's only as good as the data that goes in. When Ross was talking about parameterizing his ligand protein interactions, he said very carefully, well, if you do it this way, you might not get very good results. You have to be very careful about it, but hopefully somebody has tested this and how good they are before. And finally, maybe we can use some quantum computers to do stuff. You can simulate them on a laptop quite easily, and you can think about new ways of trying to do chemistry on a quantum computer with a bit of work on paper. So ultimately, there are huge numbers of directions available in computational chemistry that you can do without needing to have an expensive lab, toxic chemicals, or any of these things. And the world is your oyster about being able to do them, so go and try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Nick, you are also great. Okay, right. Now, after two days, finally, we come to the end. So we'll just change the slides in a minute. This is not going to take the 15 minutes that's in the program. We'll do it in five or 10 minutes. Look, well done for surviving two days of very hard work. Right. Um, we came with an objective, and in a moment you'll see the slides. We we look at the objectives of the Africa of our teams initiative, and we tried to fulfil the objectives. We came to depart knowledge as colleagues. Yesterday, I presented what I think was more accessible knowledge around techniques that are familiar to you. You will have done them in courses, you will have seen them in the labs. Today, it was taken to a different level. Today, it was cutting edge computational techniques that we figured would be way beyond what we were thinking before. But the objective is to push you to your limits and to prepare you for whatever you decide to do next. Also, all of this, of course, David, is online. You'll be able to go back and listen to this and follow it in your own time and do it carefully. But by giving you here, getting you here today as a group of scholars, we're hoping that you'll be able to sort of feel united in the endeavor of being resilient and wanting to do great science. Now, what David wanted me to do is sort of say the sort of things that we discussed over the years back in Cambridge. You know, the old, you're good, you know, be resilient. And I think the more I thought about overnight, that's about right. So, well, first things first. We are here because David and his team. As we said to you yesterday, it's something we believe in. What he's doing is important. So we congratulate him. We congratulate the team that supported us, Chisholm, Jim Francis, Drew, and the whole team. They put this together and the university supported us. Your professors care about you. The Africa of our Dreams Initiative cares about you. We've met you and we think you're terrific. So first and foremost, thank you to David and the team. Congratulations, really wonderful work. Okay, so only really a few picture slides. Won't take very long at all. So that, they're the initiatives. Read them. If you've got the booklet, absorb them because this is for you, right? And it does say it's about providing a platform for information enabling. That's what today and yesterday was about. It says identify and articulate advances in education. That's what I hope we did yesterday and today. It says to promote personal and professional development. We may not have spoken to every one of you in the last two days, and for that I apologize. Because you've been so welcoming, I think we have spoken and met more of you than we would have in any other university we've been to, where you end up meeting a small group of people. And that is, again, a credit to you. And also, ensure effective guidance and so on. Now, the human bit. You're all very close to other people, so I want you to turn to your neighbors if you're close to someone, tap each other on the shoulder or shake hands and congratulate each other, okay? Fantastic. You're a community. And you are quite remarkable. 
And again, the people that we've met from Nigeria in England are impressed us enough, which is what made us come here. You are remarkable. And I say this because in the last couple of days, and not only do all of you have smiles that light up a room, and that is something most people can't do, okay? <laughs> But when the wonderful, our wonderful host, who has been absolutely brilliant the last couple of days, when she went around the room and put people to stop, we sat there thinking they won't have anything to say. We were stuck when a number of you stood up and said things that convinced us not only did they listen to what we said, they understood what we said. And that, my friends, is remarkable. So, what am I going to tell you that your professors have already told you or your parents have already told you that you may forget or not listen? Life is tough, and you know that better than most. There are obstacles here, but you seem to endure. Life, whatever you do next, and I'm not trying to be patronizing, life is tough for all of us. Accept it, embrace it, and use the skills you have to do well. Never put yourself down. And in particular, I will look to the women in the audience who traditionally, my mother, your mothers, our grandmothers, overcame significant obstacles to get to where we are in the 21st century. And the way we're going to do great science is that we're all in this together. Women are not the problem. Gentlemen, often we are the problem creating obstacles for women. So you have to help each other. The way Nigeria will roar is if the lions and lionesses do their part. Your professors yesterday, when we met them over, um, over lunch today, spoke with great passion about not losing all their talent overseas. I agree with them. Go overseas, make friends, but don't forget where you came from. I say that because I myself am Australian with Greek descent. I never forget where I came from, and I never forget the teachers in my underrepresented, poor neighboring school who inspired me. I don't forget my parents who encouraged me. I hope you don't forget that either. The journey where you go to will be determined by where you came from. So never forget that. Never forget your country. Never forget your community. Don't forget the university that's educated you. Be resilient. Be confident. Be strong. You never fail in life. I hope you're not with the generation of kids, you know, the internet generation that lives their lives through these things. These are a wonderful technical innovation. They're pretty technology and nothing wrong. Don't live your life through phones. Live your life by talking to people. If you should try to do something, it doesn't work out the way that you wanted it to, you didn't fail. There is no failure. It's just it didn't work out the way you expected it to. Don't give in too easily. We care about you. And if I talk now about you and us from Cambridge, all you've got to do is use the internet. So in Cambridge, if you just go to our, the departmental website, you see all the information about what we do. There are little banners across the top about the research that we do, about the people that do it, about the networks and so on. It just happens that the front page has the icon of the event that we host in the department for the Black Women in Science Network that's run by a Nigerian student in Cambridge, British born, who came along once a bit like we spoke to David. I heard that she's doing this work. I said, hello, I think we should talk. And I said, what you do seems to be amazing. What can we do to help you? So I'd like to get my friends together and say, why don't you bring them up to Cambridge? We can't afford it. We'll pay for lunch. We'll pay for the drinks. Bring them together. And it was one of the most extraordinary days I've had. Like you, there were about 60 young women who just smiled at me, hugged each other all day, talked about their lives all day, and were there to connect via LinkedIn, which they were not really good at, so that they would stay connected for the rest of their careers. Why is that so your life is good. And if you apply overseas, as I've said to many of you the last two days, we will notice. Don't discriminate against yourself. 
I 
before that, Nick already did. I read half of them. So I'm going to skip all of those uh, long stories and say the rest of the planet just now talk about. I think get that on, I, I did mention about how amazing can be. And uh, during Nick's presentation, he shared a page with Ralph Black and Leslie Hall. And then that reminds me of some of the things actually uh, I was one of the two associates researchers that helped set up the black and uh, so it was nice to see that lots of that uh, that kind of lots of men because we were trying to do uh interview of black students across the bridge and staff them and so what's happening trying to understand the problems they're facing and how we can set up such hard to support our students and So, yeah, it feels good just to see that some of the things are still to be sure to do. Then I think the next thing I wanted to remind us is um, all the people who have registered will be issued a certificate of participation for this program. However, we have an evaluation form. Um, we don't want to use the registration form to issue certificate because someone might have registered or the person can show. So what we wanted to do is send you the evaluation form. If you've not been receiving email or to be registered, I think it's just meet one of our volunteers and make sure you give them your email address so we are able to send you evaluation form. So within the evaluation form, they are going to give us the name, the way you want it to appear on your certificate. Okay? So once we receive that, they will pick your name, then you will receive your, your certificate. Please take some time. Um, like we did mention, this event was partly funded by the US Center of Chemistry. And one of the conditions is that we need to evaluate the impact we need, how this event went. Don't you please, don't, don't paint something white when it's black. There is something you think that didn't work well, something you think you have done better, please be honest and tell us. That is the only way we can improve future events. If you decide to, I want to say something sweet, and you just mislead us, that's not helpful to us. We want to become better. So please, where you think we've done well, do feel free to tell us we've done well here. Where you think that we need improvement, please like to have uh, that honesty. So please don't mislead us. So once you've done that, you will receive a certificate. And please, when you receive the certificate, there are two things, uh, maybe one thing I want you to do for me. If you want, it's not enough for sending you. If you want to share your certificate online, please feel free to do that with hashtag um, 2023 AODI lecture. 2023 AODI lecture or hashtag 2023 AODI action. So any of these two hashtags, use it to do that. And you can feel free to tag ODI is showing here and anyone that tags us try to share that on our page. The same thing with your photos, all the selfies you've taken, please feel free to share them on social media. The same hashtag, tag HM um, AODI, we'll be happy to also be doing that. The reason is that we want I actually tell my team, if I can do one thing, I will favor five people. And there is opportunity for me to use the same strength to see favor like 100 people. I would like to do that. So when you do that, you help us to move the message we are trying to pass. People who miss the session can go through our website, to our social platform, watch those videos, and get as much as you have gained. Okay, so please, uh, Twitter, or Facebook, or Instagram. Um, anyway, everywhere, just a few things. 
to kind of compensate. Then the next is when Alex was dealing with the computational aspects of things. I was telling you that yesterday while we were there, we were having a chat of what you could do with competition chemistry. Especially where, you know, some equipment are very expensive. I believe that computational chemistry is a way that a student can still do high quality research without actually spending much. All you need is a laptop. A whole lot of the software is not free. So you can design your own experiments in London, in the comfort of your room, and do that before. But then I look at the situation, for instance, around the department. While in Cambridge, I run some calculation that takes seven days to run. Okay, continuously. What it means that if there's anything like power interruption, I have to start the calculation. Although some software have a way of you continue from the start. So I try to imagine that and say, if we have some systems like the computer and the compartment, what about the issue of light? So that might be the problem we face. I'm not saying AODI is going to do this, but I think the next thing on my mind is to see if we can get connections somewhere, someone who provide money that we can use to. It's not something that looks like solar panel for the compartment, if that is possible. So that, you know, if you have a computer, this could help you to motivate you to actually know the direction of competition chemistry, which I think is going to make life a lot easier for you. So the implication is, I know that it's hard work. Um, I struggled a bit when I came to Cambridge because I'd never had competition background. So I knew how quick most of these things were sounding. I go for a seminar, I don't get a machine to say, you know, I can play all the time. I got a hang of it, and then I did a PhD. Okay. So why I'm saying this is that just to tell you you can do it. You might not have understood a whole lot of things today, but it's recorded, it's on YouTube. Go um, follow AODI YouTube and take your time. Another thing we try to do is to cut those videos into sections and have them on YouTube. So if you go, you can go to the areas where you're interested and you can watch the program. You can have the entire program. So once you make it easier for you, so it's, it's key that you would like to follow up on this channel so you can get that. Okay, so that's on that. And uh, the next thing we wanted to do before um, we ask the head of the department to, or maybe before the head of the department, as someone who I, I think is really amazing, I've been instrumental in helping us support this. I think the CSM president. So, you know, I thought this book is worth appreciating her. And, uh, okay, and I learned she's the first female president. So I will give you the opportunity to give us a, a, a good chance. Not now, but before then, uh, I would like to call on uh, our HOD, Professor Ejikeme, to, to please um, come help us say thank you to our facilitators. Before he gives his closing remark, he will be the last person that speaks and then close the event. But before he does that, we have some stuff that we wanted to, you know, use to say thanks to our facilitators who's the best what they are doing in UK to come back here to do this with us. So, bro, we've got a couple of sorry that we'd like to give to them. We wanted to close that. Thank you. I think the first person here is Alex.
Okay, so cameraman, I hope you are ready to. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Dave. Uh, the first one is Alex. Good. So on behalf of uh, the chairman of uh, Audi and the Audi team, this is a souvenir presented to you as a facilitator to this event. Congratulations. You're welcome. presented to you today, the first day of uh, June 2023, for um, empowering the youth through education and uh, capacity building. Congratulations. Uh, 
her contribution to this event was a very wonderful one. And like Oliver Twist, uh, we are asking for more. On behalf of the organizers, we say congratulations to her for her wonderful uh, presentation. For those of you that are Christians, it was said that in the marriage in Cana in Galilee, that the wine finished. And somebody told some people, whatever you are asked to do, do it. And when those who did what they were asked to do, and the wine started flowing again, all the people that attended the wedding started complaining. Why is it? that you received the best wine until now. On that note, we want to present the best wine to Professor Nick. The Deputy Head of Department of Chemistry at Cambridge. Yes, uh, Professor Nick, you can see that uh, the ovation is as loud as it should be. So on behalf of the group, we say thank you very much for being here. On behalf of the group, we say thank you for the promises you made to the department. Uh, we're going to go get something to uh, On behalf of the group, we we'll say more than Oliver Twist, we will want you to come again and again and again and again. Uh, finally, thank you for informing us that uh, on the Black African women in chemistry in Cambridge, that they will always smile to them. Thank you for, for informing us. Uh, Dave, we heard exactly what he said. So, on that note, uh, I make this presentation to you on behalf of the group. Congratulations. Congratulations. So, so uh, my job is done. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. So. Okay, thank you so much, Prof, um, for entertaining us and helping us with our presentation. So I think before um, I call I call Prof back uh, for a moment, like I did mention, I'm sorry if we had the money, I probably want to give everybody souvenir, but I think I wanted to specially recognize, like I did mention. Um, the Chemical Society President, Amara, so if you can come forward. I think one thing I, I realize, one thing I've come to realize in life is that when you do something without asking yourself, what do I stand to gain, at the end, you find yourself getting something. Um, I didn't pay her. I didn't send her any recharge card. I didn't do anything at all. Just on her own, she was able to support and coordinate with those that people enjoyed the volunteers. In fact, at some point, um, Professor Sibola was asking him, oh, the, like, he sees a lot of things and he knows AODI is sort of not on ground. Well, that is doing things. We are LOC, yeah, but you know, that kind of thing. That's just, just you know, having her coordinate her fellow students to support and to provide that in every program for you guys to, to do that. I, I think it's worth emulating. And so, for that, I'm going to want to say thank you to you. 
and maybe I can give you the opportunity to give that word of thanks. <laughs> Trying hard not to cry. Great Catherine Sananayons. That is not loud. Great Catherine Sananayons. Good evening, Dr. Nick. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dr. Bank, for putting yourself into this event. It's obvious that the passion with which you explain things is more than what we could ever imagine. Thank you, Dr. David. So truly speaking, it was difficult convincing even myself of what this whole fresh should look like because we've not had anything of this kind before. But the moment you communicated the reason behind wanting to do this, I knew it was going to be the bomb and I just had to give it my all. I was just told, help me coordinate students and get them to be part the conference. And I had to do all of my best. Thank you to our lecturers. Thank you to the head of the department. Thank you for staying here all day. It's very encouraging. My children. I can't say how proud I am to be leading this department. Like I said on my status yesterday, the enthusiasm is contagious. I'm trying to wonder what I said that made you to pull out in this number for two straight days. I know the kind of hard work it would take to leave all of your schedules and be here to learn. Learning is not easy, but I want to say thank you for not making me to form my hand in the presence of our guests. PIC, God bless you. I am very proud to be leading the people. So what I want to say finally is that we have been freely challenged with what the technology is now, with what we have heard and seen. I'm sure if you were almost giving up, you should have gotten some sort of spark to continue. And I'm going to tell you to sit down and find how you will contribute to the world with what you've heard today. You'll be a great thing in the next five, 10 years when we hear that after this AODI conference in my second year or my third in my final year, I got the spark to do this, and we would celebrate it. Thank you for coming once again, and practice what you learned. God bless you. Okay, so I don't waste your time. Um, we thought that we needed to appreciate someone else who made life easier for us. Um, well, I don't need to tell you stories. This is where you live, and you know how things go. Um, and so on that note, I would like to call on the Professor Sibuloni. <laughs> Jen Francis. As you already know, uh, Professor Sebulo um, is the chairman of the local organizing committee, and I must say he did amazingly um, to navigate all the challenges we faced and all of that to get this happen. And so, Prof, I wanted to use this to say thank you. And maybe you have a word or two to say. I wasn't expecting this. Well, a lot has been done in just 48 hours. And I know that most of the students, what they have been thinking some 50 hours ago, the way they will be seeing life now, today, will be quite different. I want to once again thank the that came all the way from UK. You see, some of the professors in other 